so thank you. Uh, so today we'll be talking about how to go and build, or excuse me, uh, how, how, what is the limits of sort of chip specialization? Um, as uh, the uh, announcer said, I'm a professor at Princeton University, and this is work that's done in conjunction with one of my graduate students, Adi Fuchs. So this work really started a few years ago when I was sitting down with my students trying to ask, ans uh, ask the question of, you know, what are computers going to look like after the end of Moore's Law? So we sat around and thought about this for a few minutes, and the first thing that came to our mind is, of course, accelerators must be the answer. You know, you take your computer chip, you, you know, put some specialized accelerators on that, and that's going to be the answer that's going to solve all of our problems after the end of Moore's Law. But then we thought about it a little bit more deeply. And as we thought about it a little bit more deeply, we noticed that, whoops, sorry, uh, that, uh, you know, hey, these accelerators are built on the exact same CMOS transistors that we build our general purpose processors. And they're, because of that, they are basically uh, beholden to the same problems that our general purpose uh, processors are beholden to. So that, what is the implication of that? Well, the implication of that is that specialization is, may not be the gift that keeps on giving. So as you specialize, you, and you're building this out of transistors that sort of already exist, and those transistors stop scaling, is specialization the gift that keeps on giving? Will we be able to keep moving forward with that? So, you know, we sort of thought about this, and we're like, well, specialization is probably not the gift that keeps on giving. You can probably specialize once, maybe twice, maybe three times, but probably for the same application, you probably can't keep specializing over and over and over again. So what did we decide to do? So we decided to try to actually go and put some science behind this. So, and answer this question of, you know, can you keep specializing over and over again? So how do we go do this? Well, we want to try to understand what are these limits of accelerators, and how do we go about doing this? Well, we tried to put a little bit of science behind this, and the step one was we tried to go build a very detailed model to understand what CMOS, trans, uh, CMOS scaling has looked like in the past and might look like in the future. We did this by taking data sheets of thousands of different processors together with the traditional ITRS, IDRS uh, data, uh, scaling trends, and by doing that, we now have sort of a ground truth that we can factor out the advantage that we've gotten from having more and better transistors as uh, time has gone on. So the next step that we had to go sort of think about is ans answer the question of have accelerators and has specialization actually done good? And has, um, by doing this, we decided to come up with a new metric. So our new metric here we call chip specialization return. And chip specialization return is really a, a measure of how good of a design effort or how good of a design your specialized accelerator designer has done on a per transistor basis. So if you don't have more transistors in the future or Moore's law has sort of hit the end of the road, this is really where you have to go with specialization is trying to use those transistors more effectively. And because we have this uh, model that lets us to look at uh, CMOS uh, scaling in the past, we can actually factor out the advantages and look across different design points by factoring out the uh, advantage you've gotten from device technology. So given all of this, then we sort of wanted to try to put some science behind this. So we just conducted a study where we sort of looked at different design points and different uh, example designs that have happened in the past and what has specialization really provided there. And then given that, we could then uh, project forward. So to give a little bit of a sort of fast forward to the end of this talk, you know, after we did all this work, we actually have sort of figured out that specialization is not the gift that keeps on giving. Um, that's probably not a big surprise to a lot of people in this room, but we wanted to sort of understand what those limits of accelerators and specialization looks like with a little bit more science and a little bit more color. And I'm gonna talk about that today. So just to get people sort of understanding this metric, um, we're gonna start off by looking at the evolution of everyone's favorite financial services application. That's right, Bitcoin mining. So, you know, everyone wants to, you know, become a Bitcoin millionaire or billionaire as it might be. Um, so we plotted different ASIC Bitcoin miners and how they evolved over time and the performance of those. These, of course, are across different process generations. And then using the model that we know of what we get from the device technology, we could factor out the benefits we got from device technology. Because while you have designs that are very different in sort of performance, the, the ones to the far right here were using newer process technology and more transistors potentially than the older designs. So um, the re shaded red here on this graph is the gain that we have due to more transistors and better transistors. And what we're left with is this much more modest gain here, which is the gain due to everything else, which is basically the chip specialization return or the advantage that you've gotten due to your uh, designer building a specialized architecture. Okay, so this sort of gets us thinking about this metric. Um, now let's start thinking about a couple different case studies to look at previous designs. 
So the one thing, the uh, first case study we did is we started to go look at ASIC uh, video decoding chips. And we plotted this over sort of different uh, time scales here. And we looked at this, and we have performance and energy uh, efficiency here. And we can see that, wow, things got a lot better. You know, we're getting 64x better throughput. We're getting a lot better uh, energy efficiency. But how has the specialization or the, the benefit of someone actually trying to go build a specialized architecture really done here as a function of time? And when you go look at this, we plot chip specialization return here, we find that it's basically been flat. Um, so, you know, this is a relatively mature design space. You know, uh, H.264 decoder chips have been around for a long time. There's not a whole lot of sort of improvement going on there. So what's the takeaway? Well, mature designs have relatively little opportunity to increase uh, performance uh, going forward. So case study number two, um, we're gonna go take a look at deep uh, learning uh, accelerators. We use FPGAs here instead of ASICs because that's where we're able to get the data. But this is everyone's favorite uh, machine learning, you know, application in 2019. Once again, you might imagine that, you know, as time has gone on, people have improved uh, throughput, people have improved energy efficiency, but what happens with sort of the, the specialization where people are able to sort of specialize and continue to specialize uh, time and time again? When we go plot uh, chip specialization return, we see that actually it has gone up, and you know, a lot of this has been due to new algorithms. This has actually been a uh, relatively emerging space where we've gotten new algorithms and new designs as time's gone on, and we've seen it sort of go up about 6x, the specialization advantage, but then it's also plateaued. Um, so what's the takeaway here? Well, emerging domains still have a lot more potential to improve performance, but they probably also plateau at some point. Huh, okay, so what, where else do we go with this? We're trying to put some science behind what does specialization really do? So last thing we started to go look at here is Bitcoin mining, but we looked at Bitcoin mining moving across different uh, platforms. So we moved from CPU to GPU to FPGA to ASIC, and conveniently we were able to get all the data for this. And we can see that you know, throughput and uh, per area and if energy efficiency went up by you know, 600,000 X and a million X, and this is really great when you compare to uh, ASIC Bitcoin, or Bitcoin mining on uh, software on a general purpose CPU. But then you sort of, sort of ask the question of where is the advantage is really coming, and we start to see that chip specialization returns are much more, uh, much more muted, but when you jump between these sort of different implementation platforms, let's say moving from GPU to FPGA or FPGA to ASIC, you see a big jump in the specialization. So you're actually using those transistors more uh, effectively, if you will, by moving to a new implementation technology, or not uh, technology, but new uh, platform, if you will. But you're not able to necessarily go and run general purpose or even semi-general purpose designs you know, in a specialized ASIC. And within the platforms, the chip specialization return has been uh, very modest. Okay, so now that we sort of have seen some of these results, we now need to start to think about what is the limit? So where is this actually going and trying to project forward? How do we go about doing this? Well, we go and plot CMOS potential, so all the different designs you could possibly build up to sort of, let's say, the end of Moore's Law. So let's say the end of uh, scaling is five nanometer, or maybe there's nothing beyond that. So this dashed purple line here is the best chip we can possibly ever build in five nanometer at the reticle limit. And then we're gonna ask ourselves, what does that chip look like? And you know, is there much more space forward for a single chip accelerator? How do we go about doing this? Well, let's go do this for Bitcoin miners. So here we can see that, um, whoa. Um, so here we can see that uh, ASIC Bitcoin miners you know, hit a wall. So what do we call this? We call this an accelerator wall. So as you uh, project forward, you can have sort of conservative and optimistic accelerators and barring new uh, you know, design methodologies or barring new algorithmic changes, which are probably not gonna happen, for, especially for uh, you know, SHA-256 uh, hashing, which is a very constrained environment here, we can see that we probably have about two to 18x uh, performance gain ever. That's the best chip we can ever build sort of at the end of uh, Moore's Law, and then also uh, we have much more modest uh, gains in the energy perspective. Okay, so what are the takeaways here? What are the conclusions? First of all, mature application domains it, um, are very difficult to continue to specialize over and over again. You know, we've had a lot of, a lot of time building video uh, codecs and video decoders, and it's very difficult to keep innovating there in a well-studied space. Second, if you have a confined domain, something like uh, SHA-256 hashing, for, for instance, for Bitcoin, 
there's always so many ways to map that into a restricted set of uh, transistors. So it's very difficult to sort of come up with different ways to map that and actually have specialization be the savior that's gonna get us out of sort of the end of transistor scaling uh, uh, cost perspective. Last, um, one important thing here is that, you know, massive parallelism has traditionally been a solution. So we've thought about having more transistors, gives us more cores, gives us more parallelism, but now we have no more transistors, gives us no more cores, gives us no more parallelism, and much to my own sorrow, because I've done a lot of work in many core processor space, parallelism in many core may not be the answer sort of moving forward. So that's something we need to really think about. Okay, so is there a glimmer of hope? Yes, I think there's a glimmer of hope here. So um, all of my research in my, uh, in my group, we've been trying to tie it to things that continue to scale. In particular, one of the things that we've identified so far is we've been looking at um, having additional storage and sort of exponentially increasing storage, whether that be spinning disks, NVM technology, or possibly even um, you know, traditional 3D NAND flash continuing to scale, and then we use that storage and transform it somehow into compute. So the way we've been doing that is we've actually been uh, doing massive memoization and actually wrapping accelerators with a memoization engine. Uh, we had a paper at ISCA uh, 2018 about that. And then uh, finally, I just want to sort of conclude here and say that I want to thank my entire team. If you want to learn more about this, please go read our paper at HPCA 2019 or our paper at ISCA uh, 2018. Thank you.